All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut. Welcome to our noontime chat. I'm talking about preservation. Today's edition, we're talking about the Sustainable Historic House with Marina Wisniewski from the State Historic Preservation Office. We're really excited to have Marina back again. This is such a hot topic for all of our constituents. So we're encouraging you all to ask your questions and participate along the way. Marina has a wonderful presentation in store for us. So quickly, um, Preservation Connecticut, for those of you who don't know us, we were established in 1975 as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly. And we are statutory partners with the State Historic Preservation Office working as the statewide nonprofit historic preservation organization, doing advocacy, education, technical assistance, um, and outreach. We have a staff of eight and a mighty board of 24 preservationists. Pictured here is our boarding house, our office in Hamden, Connecticut at the Eli Whitney um, Museum and National Register District. Um, part of our staff, we have Chris Wiegren, Deputy Director. He is an architectural historian. He has published a book on Connecticut architecture. He um, edits our bi-monthly magazine, Preservation News. He runs our easement program and currently is um, neck deep in a statewide survey project um, Olmsted in Connecticut, our wonderful landscape survey that our staff in partnership with the SHPO office and a consultant team are doing right now in Connecticut. Renee Trebert, our preservation services manager, is our expert on all things to do with industrial mill sites. And she also runs our tax credit program, um, helping uh, small developers with their tax credit applications and national and state register nominations. Jordan Sorensen, Development and Special Projects Manager, runs almost soup to nuts things in our office, but uh, development um, activities and assisting Renee with special projects. Kristen Hopewood, our Development Assistant, helping us with our membership and our events and our social media. And our circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Stacey Vero, and Mike Farino, who are our boots on the ground, who respond to your preservation calls and provide immediate technical assistance. So these uh, chats that we've been doing on Wednesdays are a way for us to continue our mission during these strange COVID times. And they are the um, brainchild of Stacey Vero. So she coordinates all these wonderful um, programs for us and keeping us connected with our constituents and giving you the opportunity to get to know us better and, and, and flesh out any preservation questions that you have. are really enjoying these programs and enjoying the participation that we're getting from everyone. So um, please uh, be sure to contact us afterwards if you have questions and during the program if you have questions as well. And if you're curious about this image, this is the silo, um, Hunt Hill Farm in New Milford. We're gonna be there this Sunday with our Barn photography show, Picturing History, Historic Barns of Connecticut will be on display inside the barn and we'll be doing an open house and a barbecue on the grounds of the farm. And it's a wonderful place. So I invite you all to sign up and come join us next this Sunday, October 3rd from 12 to three at the silo. And just quickly next week, we'll be um, talking about Olmsted in Hartford. So please be sure to to join us then for um, more discussion on our Olmsted survey and Olmsted's early influences from the Hartford. So with that, I'm going to take my screen down and let Marina share. And I hope you'll introduce yourself a little bit, Marina, as the National Register Specialist and Architectural Historian at the SHPO that hardly describes all that you do there. You wear many, <laughs> many hats. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. First of all, can everybody see my first slide? Yes. Thumbs up would be good. Thank you, Jane. Um, so my name is Marina Wisniewski from the State Historic Preservation Office. I'm the State Register Coordinator, uh, and I also do environmental review compliance. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the inherent 
sustainability of historic homes. And I also received some questions um, that I hope most of them will be answered through the presentation, but if there are more questions that you have, I will try and make a concerted effort to enter them, uh, to answer them all individually. Um, so it's a bit of a running joke that when people talk about sustainable homes, they think of something that's either a tree or a hobbit's den. Um, but in actuality, most historic homes were built to be efficient by design. And if they are maintained on a regular basis are quite sustainable. Today, I'm going to talk about some ways you as a homeowner can improve the energy efficiency of your home. There is a lot of material that I'm going to go through in a very short amount of time. So it's gonna be fairly broad, um, but more information on each topic can be found on our website in our guide, Energy Efficiency for Historic Houses. As with most things, it's always good to start with a plan. And in order to create that plan, we need to set our goals. Any house, old or new, is a system. The parts all work together, sometimes effectively, sometimes ineffectively. It's important to remember this when you are thinking what it is you want to accomplish by making your home more efficient. For most people, that would be lowering their energy costs by reducing the amount of energy expanded. In a house built prior to 1950, it is generally possible to improve energy efficiency by 30 to 40%, effectively making it as efficient as a conventional house that was built after the year 2000. For others, it's simply the idea of using existing resources to reduce the amount of waste that ends up in landfills. It takes an estimated 20 to 30 years for a new building to compensate for the energy expended for its construction. Most historic buildings have already expended that energy several times over. And for some people, their goals for improving energy efficiency also include keeping characteristics of their house that they love. Windows, doors, shutters, radiators, things that they might have been told would need to be replaced in order to make their house green. That is simply not the case. There are many ways to go about improving energy efficiency in a home, and there is a lot of information offered. For historic homes, the goal is to improve energy efficiency while maintaining a home's historic integrity. As each resource is unique, it's important to know your home before you prescribe treatment. So, as we all know, historic properties come in many varieties, exhibiting different character-defining features. Something is character-defining, a National Park Service definition, if it is a visual aspect or physical feature that comprises the appearance of a historic building. Character defining elements include the overall shape of a building, its materials, craftsmanship, decorative details, interior spaces and features, as well as the various aspects of its site and environment. This is a photo of 14 Charter Oak Place, a contributing resource to the Charter Oak Place National Register Historic District in Hartford. It is a two and a half story frame house built in 1876 for Charles H. Northam, a flower merchant. So we're gonna have a little public participation. What would be considered some character defining features for this building, just based on the photo? Unmute yourselves and shout it out. Slate roof. Slate roof, great. What else? Original fenestration. Original fenestration? Oh, we're using some, we're using some high level vocabulary here. All right, what about- Turret. Um, Turret. A turret. <laughs> right, a turret. Uh, a, a gothic tower in the front, slate roof. Okay. What about, what's, what is the building clad in? What's that siding look like? What is that? Weatherboarding. Clapboard, wood, right? Okay. So all of these could be considered character defining features. Some character defining features, while beautiful, are also practical and contribute to a home's passive efficiency. As an example, the shutters that most people keep fixed in place were meant to be used to shield interior spaces from the sun while also allowing breeze to pass through. Deep covered porches serve a similar purpose. Steep, dark colored roofs with little overhang uh, are characteristic of many 18th century New England houses because of their ability to effectively shed snow and attract heat for warmth. As fuel was an ever pressing concern for people who had previously been accustomed to mostly rainy winters instead of snow, homes were designed to maximize heat retention from the roof line to, to the plan, which in 18th century houses often centered the heat source in the middle of the structure, allowing heat to radiate out to each room. The vestibule was also a tool of temperature regulation, an intermediary space between outside and inside. The siding of residences and treatment of the lot was also important. Northern elevations typically had few windows, and were planted with coniferous trees to protect against northern winds in winter. Conversely, southern elevations usually contained more windows with deciduous trees that shaded the house in summer and allowed solar heat in winter. 
Perhaps the most obvious passive energy feature that we are familiar with today are double hung windows. Uh, pop seventh grade science question. Does hot air rise or fall? Somebody unmute themselves. It rises. rises. It rises, okay. So double hung windows allow for each sash to operate independently. And by lowering the upper sash and raising the lower sash, hot air near the top of the room migrates out as cooler air migrates in from the bottom. With features like these, it is entirely possible to improve a home's energy efficiency without adversely impacting its historic fabric. Some of the most effective energy improvement techniques are reversible, and as an added bonus, relatively inexpensive. But before making any changes, it's a good idea to schedule an energy audit, which will help determine where energy is being lost. Part of the energy assessment will be a blower door diagnostic test, which will depressurize the help and help determine where air and energy is being lost. The main benefit to an energy audit is to establish a baseline for energy performance so that any changes can be evaluated for their effectiveness. It's important to prepare for an energy audit ahead of time as it will include the entirety of the structure, attic to basement. So keep the following things in mind. So most of this is some pretty obvious stuff. So make sure that your building envelope is solid, clear areas so that the technician can get to all the areas of access. Make sure that there's nothing hazardous that could be blown around. Make sure that anybody in the house or animals are in a safe place. So most of this is because of the blower door test and is meant to prevent anything hazardous from being circulated to that throughout the house. The technician will also ask questions to help determine any specific areas of concern. So you may wanna familiarize yourself with things such as the year your house was built, its total square footage, the age of the appliances and its utilities, and if you notice any cold or hot spots. Usually the results of an energy audit offer some immediate simple ways to improve energy efficiency. One that doesn't impact the house at all and should be the first step is to replace incandescent light bulbs with LEDs. Even in homes where lighting may play an important part to the feeling of spaces, new advances in lighting provides for a variety of brightness and settings and color temperature. Another is to regulate thermostats, either by reducing heating or cooling by a degree or two or programming thermostats for when you are home and when you aren't. For plumbing, fixing leaks and insulating pipes are some of the easiest methods to eliminate energy waste. Once a baseline is established, a homeowner can begin to plan for intervention through a variety of methods. I'm going to quickly go through all those methods and point out ways a homeowner can improve energy efficiency on their own and some treatments that require professional assistance. So air sealing. Correcting air leaks provides one of the greatest returns on investment. It's inexpensive and if done correctly, reversible. Air leaks can account for anywhere between five and 40% of heating and cooling costs. So it's important to detect where air is entering and exiting. The blower test as part of the energy audit helps to detect air leaks, but homeowners can also test for, test for leaks themselves by using a candle or a smoke test. Usually air leaks are found in the following areas. So on the exterior corners, outdoor faucets, utilities, um, joints between siding and chimneys, the joints between the foundation and the siding materials and around the door and the window frames. Um, in the interior, especially attic doors and hatches, attic and basement floors and ceilings where there's a chimney, vents, corners, window frames, door frames, baseboards, fireplace dampeners, wall or window mounted air conditioners, basement windows, gas service connections, and then also the basement structure. When sealing air leaks, material is important. The goal is to have it be reversible. Latex caulking is often the most inexpensive and user-friendly option, and as a bonus can be painted. While spray foam is sometimes recommended for sealing spaces, if it's not preservation friendly, it can stain, it can off gas, and it can mask other problems like mold. Usually the most effective areas to seal are the attic and the basement, both places where the majority of air enters and leaves the house. Other places to seal include around the windows and doors, which can be accomplished with weather stripping, which I'll talk about a little later when I discuss windows. It's also important to remember that the goal is to reduce the amount of air infiltration while also allowing the house to breathe as it was designed to and to avoid accumulating any moisture. Insulation is a tricky subject. What is the goal of insulation? Does anybody know? I mean, there's a lot of reasons, but I so, mean, what, what's that goal? To slow down the transfer of heat. To slow down the, I literally wrote that down. Thank you. 
<laughs> to slow down the transfer of heat. Most houses were not insulated prior to 1940, and if they were, it was with things like newspaper and brick nogging. Insulation is rated commonly by R factor, the resistance to transferring heat. The higher the number, the better it insulates. As with air leaks, there are areas within historic homes that are good places to start to insulate. And in many homes, these places may have already been insulated at some point in the past. Um, they include the basement, the attic, pipes, and ducts. The benefits of starting here is there are typically no historic finishes to be disturbed. There are, very, there are a variety of insulation materials to choose from, each with different R values and different applications. As with air sealing, uh, spray foams are not reversible and should not be used on historic fabric. Also like air sealing, there is that question of moisture buildup when insulating the structure. As heat is not passing as easily through the structure, exterior materials remain colder and wetter for longer, which may lead to more maintenance or deterioration. The question of wall insulation in a historic home is problematic as something has to be removed to allow for its installation. This, depending on the type of insulation, could be a small cut into plaster, the remover, removal of exterior siding, or, and not recommended, the removal of interior wall finishes. If too much insulation is added to an existing wall cavity, plaster wall systems can fail, which is evidenced by broken keys or lath. Additionally, wood frame structures often contain a wall cavity that helps to keep interior wall systems dry. Adding insulation can sometimes cause unintentional moisture problems and sometimes rot. In the case of masonry structures, wall insulation can keep materials wetter for longer, creating similar moisture problems or material deterioration. So it's important to monitor that if you do decide to install insulation. So now one of my favorite parts and the part we often get the most questions, windows. Windows are the eyes to the soul of a building. And I truly believe that, I don't just say it. During this soul gaze, you can learn a lot about that building in a very short period of time. In addition to the cultural value they hold, historic windows offer a number of benefits. They are often made of quality materials by a quality craftsman. They are repairable multiple times. They are custom made for your house and they provide an aesthetic quality that new windows can't. So if all of this is true, why do so many houses have replacement windows? If you haven't seen this movie, it's a really great movie starring Danny DeVito and Richard Dreyfuss, and I highly recommend you watch it. Um, much like the aluminum siding salesman who would walk down the street door to door, I'm sure you've seen window salesmen do the same thing. And they have a great pitch. Your windows look a bit shabby. They're not energy efficient. Aluminum storms aren't very appealing. Our windows are approved by the local commission. That's my favorite one. It's possible that this type of scenario contributes to the number of homes that have replacement windows. All of those statements sound reasonable. And the fact that they were approved by the local district commission, that sounds pretty good, right? If you don't know the facts about replacement windows, how would you counter at that? So there is a counter to all these statements. Um, just quickly, they may not be new, but they work. A properly weatherized window a, with a storm window functions effectively like a new insulated window. Aluminum storms are effective, do not require any major investment if they are already there, are environmentally friendly, and protect the historic windows. New windows, and above all, new windows are not of the same quality of the original windows. The wood they are made out of is less dense. They provide comparable energy efficiency to the existing window. Uh, getting new windows provide comparable energy efficiency at a significant cost. Each new window unit has a finite lifespan and is not repairable. And above all, new windows are not custom made. They're, no matter how many times they say they can be custom made, it's not custom made to match the existing windows in material, configuration, size, and month in profile. Replacement windows are simply the last resort. They are there to replace what's been lost. If you have windows that are in good shape or simply need some small repairs, there is no need to replace them. And in fact, replacement for sustainability's sake isn't all that effective. A single pane double hung wood window has an approximate R value of one. A double pane insulated double hung window has an approximate R value of three. And yes, you, unless you are in Wheel of Fortune, two Rs aren't worth that much. One of the main benefits of retaining historic windows is the practicality of repair. Almost any element can be fixed. Contemporary windows are units. That is, they are a closed system and once that is damaged, 
it is almost impossible to repair. And additionally, from a preservation standpoint, windows are almost always character defining features of a building. You can see that there is a plethora of window types indicative of different eras and styles. This is a list of 10 reasons why it's a good idea to keep historic windows, which I'm not going to read, but their highlights include they're more economical, better return on investment, they're greener, they're functional, and they're absolutely unique. I like to use the analogy of a damaged car. If you need to replace a door or a panel, they do make replacements. It will be professionally installed, but it will never quite fit like the original. So what can you do to immediately improve the energy efficiency of your historic windows? These are easy things that you can do at home right now. Window draft stoppers, insulated shades or curtains, rope cock, window draft shields, and above all general maintenance, paint wood sashes, spot fill any glazing putty, keep the sashes sliding smoothly and monitor sash cords and replace them if it's necessary. There are more intensive energy efficiency measures that should be undertaken by a professional, which includes the installation of metal weather stripping and the installation of storm windows. Both of these items need to be custom fit for the best result. So it's a good idea to get someone experienced. Preservation Connecticut has a direct year of professionals sorted by category. Doors are similar to windows. Um, though I don't think they're the eyes, maybe the mouth. And people are also going to suggest that you replace those two. Um, this is an actual mailer that I got. The same treatment for windows are similar for doors and include regular maintenance such as painting and patching and the installation of weather stripping. There is also the option of a storm door which should be chosen carefully so as not to detract from the historic door. I talked earlier about the inherent energy saving features that were built into historic homes because fuel sources weren't as plentiful, plentiful and modern cooling didn't exist. Now that these systems do exist, many people have grown accustomed to them. Given also the discussion we had about insulation and moisture, it's not the wisest idea to create an interior space that's 50 degrees when the exterior temperature is 90 degrees. This is hyperbole, but the general principle is the same. It is possible to create climate controlled spaces in historic houses but it is unrealistic and undesirable to expect you to create a hermetically sealed environment by installing a new HVAC system. What should be desired and expected is to integrate a system into a home by utilizing its inherent climate control characteristics coupled with new reversible technology. Generally, installing new pipes or ductwork should be avoided if there is infrastructure already in place. As an example, the furnace, the furnace shown is a natural gas furnace hot water heater, which is connected to existing radiators. The only major change to improve the efficiency here was to remove the oil burning furnace and conventional hot water tank. In regards to cooling, when there is no existing ductwork to use, high velocity mini ducts are an option as they are smaller and flexible compared to traditional ductwork and require less intervention into historic fabric. And if it is seasonal cooling, um, which often we get in New England, room air conditioners, which bent through a small tube out a window are more effective at cooling and do not damage any historic fabric. I actually have two. So we've talked about how to conserve energy. Let's talk a little bit about some alternative sources. A significant question when it comes to energy efficiency is the introduction of solar. And it has both detractors and supporters. A typical residential solar installation relies on solar voltaic panels, usually installed on a roof, but can also be installed in, the, in a ground mounted array. Solar installations have the possibility to negatively impact above ground and below ground resources. So therefore placement becomes the key. General guidance is that panels, if installed on buildings, should be placed on non-public facing slopes, usually either on the side or the rear, or placed on a non-historic structure on the property, like an addition or an outbuilding. For ground-mounted arrays, they should be placed in an area that will not disrupt the scenic view, and the area, if not already disturbed, should be evaluated for its potential to contain archaeological deposits. Geothermal heat pumps are another possible option for renewable energy for homes. They rely on the Earth's constant temperature for heating and utilize less energy than conventional furnace systems. Like round-mounted solar arrays, the area of installation should be evaluated for archaeological sensitivity before installation. There are other types of renewable energy, including wind power, hydropower, and biomass fuel, but these are typically outside the realm of a single homeowner. However, our guide also includes information on each type if you're interested. Above all, it is important to remember that technology is ever evolving 
and that elements introduced into a structure may soon become obsolete and need to be removed or cause unforeseen conditions. So this is a monster of a furnace, <laughs> but many homes were built with this in place for heating. And this is the space in my home where the oil furnace was and a photo of my current furnace. Based on the footprint, it also looks like where the it was where the original coal furnace was. Because this was in the basement, no historic fa fabric was damaged when the furnace was replaced. But what about this picture? Those cuts were made for a very specific unit. And once it wears out, like my furnace did, what replaces it? Do you make another intervention? You can't put it back. Historic fabric has been lost for the sake of a 30 year old appliance. My house was here long before me and hopefully it will be here long after. As a steward of a historic property, I enjoy my house, but I also have a responsibility to take care of it, just like you have a responsibility to take care of yours. And I also feel a responsibility to be sustainable and many of you feel the same way. So luckily being sustainable and being historic go hand in hand. Before embarking on energy upgrades, remember the following. Decide what you want to accomplish. Understand the historic character of your home. Evaluate your current conditions and create a holistic plan that is primarily reversible. There is so much more to read about sustainability in our handbook, which you can find on our website, as well as additional guidance from the National Park Service and MPS.gov. And um, also these additional resources, especially the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation um, has a lot of great links that are offered by the National Park Service, but also programs that the federal government is doing to help create their own um, sustainability initiative for the buildings that they own. So these are all just a jumping off point. I hope you found this helpful. Um, if you have any questions, we are at the bag end, the Lord of the Rings pun. Um, so feel free to ask your questions and thank you. That's great. Thank you, Marina. Yeah, no problem. I have a, maybe a dumb question. Can you describe, you were talking about homeowners can do their own um, energy audit test by doing a candle or smoke test. What do you mean by that? So a candle or smoke test is when you are looking at a very specific area. Like when you, when you, in preparing for an energy audit, if you were saying, you know, you felt any cold spots or if you kind of are in a room and you feel a breeze, um, you can either take a candle or you can take smoke. And if you go up to an area where you feel there's going to be, where you feel it's cold, if you watch the smoke or the flame, if it moves and it moves up and out, that's how you know you have an air leak. Um, it's a quick way to do it, but of course, if you want, you know, real data, um, an energy audit is probably the better way to do it. But if it's for something where you wanna make a quick repair, you know, or you wanna put a window dampener or something, if you just wanna make sure that if that seal isn't working, you can put it right next to the window. And if you see it move, you can seal that up on your own. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. <laughs> and, so, um, oh, go ahead. I have a question, actually, I'm not sure if it's to Marina or actually to Jane is, where can we point people who are looking for window repair? Obviously, the window salesmen come to your house. The window repair people don't do mass marketing. And if we have a colleague or a friend that's looking for window repair, where do we send them? You can send them to Preservation Connecticut. We do have a directory that has um, folks in it that do specialize in historic wood window repair. And we um, have our circuit riders who can make a site visit and maybe give us on site for what folks can do with their windows. And we do occasionally offer a hands-on workshop. And during COVID, we've had to you know, postpone these, these workshops, but we do offer training for homeowners who want to learn how to do these for themselves. And that has been a really popular program that we hope we can um, resume in the near future. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Can I ask Marina a question? Yes, go ahead. Sure. Um, back on the insulation, so one of the insulation slides, um, when he talked about uh, the exterior wall cavities and he talked about some of the problems that that can cause for the interior plaster, it was hard to read some of the um, some of the verbiage that was on that slide. I, I guess I wasn't, I didn't pick up, were you implying that that um, kind of exterior wall detail was problematic or was, was a good thing or maybe could you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically the idea was to show a diagram of what's going on inside a wall cavity and if insulation is installed in the cavity. And the juxtaposition was the wall next to it where you see a bunch of um, broken plaster piece. Um, so the goal, the idea was to describe that if you overfill a wall cavity, so when you're filling it with insulation, and as I mentioned, there are different ways of installing insulation. If you are being considerate of historic fabric, what you don't want to do is you don't want to remove that interior finish. You don't want to remove the lap in order to install insulation if you're considering your historic fabric. Um, so there are other different flexible methods of insulation. So blown in insulation, then to uh, close and open foam insulation. And when you blow it in, you have, to have, you have to be an experienced technician because if they do blow it in and there's too much, there was a pressure in the cavity and that can actually cause um, the irregular keys on the interior to crack and break. And so then you have a loose plaster wall. Um, so that was the idea is to just show one, an interior wall diagram, and two, just to kind of show caution when you do install insulation that you want to make sure that you have a professional who's able to fill that volume cavity to an appropriate level, but not exceed it so that it could damage the wall. Great, thank you. Um, hello there. Let me turn off your sound. <laughs> Sorry for a little feedback um, right at lunch hour. Um, so my mom and I, Ellen, were at our old house, 1690s, 1700s house in Connecticut, working on it today. We we're getting ready for stabilization. And I uh, was really looking forward to this presentation because sustainability and passive design strategies is something that we feel is really appropriate for a house of this age, an old salt box with south facing windows. Um, would you be comfortable sharing your presentation and really letting me know um, when we could have the chance to hear more about your work and expertise on this? Sure, absolutely. Um, and then what I can also do is, I don't know if, if you guys, um, I'm sure Preservation Connecticut sends out a post, um, thanks for meeting with us email. Um, maybe we can provide some, I can provide the direct link to um, our document on our website, all the websites I mentioned here. And there's, there's some especially good resources that the National Park Service has um, that could be helpful. Um, there's also a great website, um, the whole building design guide, um, which is focused on federally owned buildings, but it's a great resource that shows you different places where they're actually using data about how to, what's, what's effective both from a cost saving perspective and then from a sustainability perspective when they reuse historic buildings. Um, so I can send you all of that too. And I think this presentation is being recorded and I think Preservation of Connecticut is gonna post it on their website. That's right, Marina. Thank you. And someone also put in the chat to look at windowpreservationalliance.org too. So we'll compile all of these resources for you and send them out. Hi, could, could I ask a question? Yes, go ahead. Um, this is related to the uh, question that uh, was previously asked about wall insulation. Um, and I'm wondering, I mean, you've you suggested, you know, monitoring it, but um, that, that's rather difficult. And um, I'm wondering if there has been follow-up um, analysis of walls and different kinds of insulation that was used. Of course, every house is different, your circumstances differ, but just, um, you know, there has long been a feeling that blown in insulation um, can be, you know, can lead to deterioration and water, you know, being trapped in the walls. Uh, does that actually happen? You know, how dangerous is it? Um, do, do you, you know, I, it, it's just this follow-up as to what over time has been the consequences of right. This. So that's why one of the best things to do is to do that energy audit first. 
Um, so I'm going to speak first in a, in a micro level, um, and then I, and then I will speak to the point, you know, that it's difficult to do that. Um, I'm going to speak to the micro level, and I'm going to speak to a macro level. Um, so the reason it's important to get an energy audit is to establish that baseline. And so you understand all the conditions of your house as they are. You are the best person to know how your house operates because you live in it. So you experience all the kind of things, you know, your creaky floors, you know, that squeaky window, you know, you know it better than anybody else. And if you have that baseline of what that energy audit is, when you make those interventions, you're able to tell the difference if a condition may develop as a result of those interventions. Um, so that's where that monitoring idea comes from, is that if you notice that, you know, on the exterior, let's say you walk outside in the morning and, you know, you normally turn around and look at your house before you, you know, get in the car or something, and you notice that there seems to be a lot of moisture buildup on one elevation or another elevation that wasn't there before, or you notice that your house is flaking a lot of paint, but you only painted it five years ago, you know, and that's never happened in the in all that time you've lived there. That may be an indication that there's a lot of that there's a lot of wetness. As far as a larger macro question of what do we have for science, the hard part is that all of this is new, um, relatively new. So as far as hard data, there aren't the, you know, we would love a table of data that says, you know, we've installed it in this many thousand properties and this is the, the conditions that we found in each. What I will direct you to for more data is that, um, that whole building design guide um, website because it provides you to a lot of different resources and it provides you a lot of um, smaller type of studies that can help inform it. And again, you know, doing this is, is, you know, and one of the things that that whole, um, that whole building website, you know, makes a point to say is that sustainability and historic preservation are no brain partners because it's the, they call it the ultimate recycling project. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if I would go so far as calling it a recycling project, but they go hand in hand because the greenest building is the one that's already built less things go in landfills if you reuse them. My whole discussion about windows are that they can be repaired an infinite amount of times. That's why, you know, from a green perspective, you know, even regardless of, a, of a, if you were a preservationist or not, which of course I am and I'm going to advocate that everybody retain their historic windows. But if you're just from a sustainability perspective, you can use, reuse them over and over and over again. So, Part of that, though, is to get into this kind of compromise of where you're, you're kind of taking a, a test here. You're doing a test where you've kind of covered your bases where it's, you know, you want to make interventions. One of the reasons we say it's removable because we don't know their long-term track performance record. We don't know yet. We hopefully will when people keep compiling all these data and people do their own monitoring and report on this and share it with each other. But right now, um, I, I'm not aware that we have a large scale study, but again, I would totally recommend that website um, to look at some of those studies that they've done, the whole building design guide, because it's backed by, you know, uh, at least a dozen government agencies that are making a concerted effort to really find the facts um, and the data on this. And I actually, um, you know, one a good thing to kind of discuss is maybe Jane is, um, you know, when the boarding house did their energy audit to improve their energy efficiency. Um, and, you know, you, of course, can speak to me more than I can. But um, after they had done their audit, they made some improvements, some really easily, um, you know, no brainer stuff, which was the installation of new storm windows, the repair of their existing windows, um, painting. Um, and then they also did exterior wall insulation. Um, and, you know, they all, um, there was, there was some, you know, it looked like there was, there was some buildup of moisture on one elevation. Um, so, you know, one of the thoughts was, oh, could it have been from the insulation? Um, but, you know, there was also a new roof that was put on at the time. And so the insulation of the roof and the gutters, could that have caused the increase in uh, buildup of moisture and ultimately the flaking of paint necessitating the repainting of the building? Um, and Jane, you know, you had mentioned that you guys had made some interventions where you had reinstalled the gutters to try and dispel that moisture. And so far, it's working. Yep, so far we're doing well. We did have, you know, a moisture problem that we had to, you know, put our heads together and figure out. Um, we did do blown in cellulose 
application. And um, it when it got wet, it did take a long time to dry that out, but it's stayed dry since we were able to, you know, isolate the source of the, the moisture. And um, I can say that the building, we're, we're located on a very busy intersection, um, the, the town line of Hamden and New Haven, and having the storm windows and the insulation, my office is much quieter than it used to be <laughs> and more comfortable temperature wise. So um, it, it was a good exercise for us to go through all of the, that thought process of how to thoughtfully handle a historic building. And we worked a lot with the SHPO office and got a lot of guidance from SHPO staff as well as you know, architects and engineers. Um, and we've been very happy with the improvements that we've made and happy with our solar panels on our roof too. I have a follow-up question on the uh, blown-in insulation. My house has insulation that was probably blown in over 50 years ago, and it's settled so that there's about two feet on the tops of the walls that isn't insulated anymore. Do you have any thoughts on how to deal with that? I would recommend that you contact an insulation professional. <laughs> I, I know, I mean, it, it's, you know, that's another thing that when I talk about maintenance, um, everything in this world requires maintenance. Um, we ourselves require maintenance. <laughs> that's why we brush our teeth. Uh, so part of it is, you know, you can't just make one intervention and think, okay, I'm done. It's for a finite period of time and then you may have to reevaluate. Um, so if they do an energy audit, you may see that, you know, that, that R factor that you were promised from the insulation has gone down over time because it's all settled and it's no longer insulating the walls. Now, however you want to deal with it, you know, you may want to check for leaks because the other thing is now that that cavity is really kind of full, um, if that insulation gets wet, it may be laying up against wood, which may proliferate mold, um, rot, that kind of stuff. So you may just want to get somebody to, to evaluate that. And then, you know, maybe give you some suggestions on either removal or addition of new insulation or if there's leaks or something like that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Nevin has their hand raised. Yes, hello. Um, so I've got a question in regards to, I guess, a lot of the information you provided in this really excellent presentation was about um, sort of mitigating um, or, um, adding to a uh, historic fabric that is already standing, I guess. But in my particular circumstance, um, I had to completely deconstruct a 1767 house. And now I am starting from square one, ostensibly. Um, so in terms of finding resources for as to um, how to go about now rebuilding and insulating again um, with while maintaining a historic facade or, you know, uh, historic methods in terms of the restoration, um, a, a more modern approach to in, uh, insulating it um, or even the restoration in general, um, where might I turn to? So um, I guess, well, we have to take a, we have to take a step back. So I, I guess the question is, you know, you're concerned about historic fabric. When you said that you're starting over, do you mean that you, you have no interior walls, everything is open and down to the studs or, you know, is it? I, I, uh, I've got the sheathing and the clapboards and the floorboards and the frame, but the, 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 the site where the building was, um, well, I mean, the building was gonna be demolished if it wasn't moved off the site. So we took it down okay. piece by piece and now it's in storage. So essentially all the plaster um, and lath that was on the studs, uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so it really is now the wooden components of the house. So that's kind of a tricky situation because what we're talking about here is basically we're building a new building using historic components. Um, and so we kind of know, you know, where all the pieces went and we're putting them back together, but we're constructing a new building. Um, so in that case, you know, I would check Preservation Connecticut's Preservation Directory for some people who are experienced um, in those types of reconstruction projects. And they could probably point you in the right direction on how to on how to go or make choices there. You know, because like I said, most of the stuff I, I say is really for if we have historic fabric in place, how do we make the least interventions possible? Here, 
we're embarking on something new and you're able to, you know, you have a lot more leeway. Um, so I would recommend checking their preservation directory and kind of talking with somebody who, who deals with reconstructions. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's, that's mostly it. I mean, I work as a preservation timber framer, so I'm doing largely all the wooden reconstruction myself. But when it comes to window uh, insulation and installation and all of that stuff, I'm, that's totally out of my league. <laughs> yeah, uh, again, you know, because it's a total, because it's a, it's a reconstruction project, you know, you, you have, you have a little more, um, a little more leeway. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Marina, uh, James has asked what your thoughts are on interior storm windows. Oh, okay. Um, in what, in what capacity, James? Um, because, you know, I, so a lot of people go with interior storms because they are concerned about the visual aspect that interior, that exterior storms have. Um, I am personally a fan, uh, and this is me speaking, you know, in my house with my 1970s triple track aluminum storms. I am a fan of those because they protect the exterior, the exterior of my windows, which are subject to, um, environmental factors, you know, especially storms, wind, that type of thing, and they perform very well. Um, for people who are interested, and again, you know, it comes to that point of, of maintenance, um, for people who are interested in, in having, um, and not having that barrier between the visual aspect of the windows, which as we discussed is incredibly important and unique to each building, um, putting an in interior storm helps, um, you know, upgrade the efficiency of that, un of, of that window um, and, but the, the converse point of that is that you, again, you know, should be very much uh, aware of your maintenance of the exterior of the windows, painting, making sure that any exterior glazing, you know, that type of thing. Is that, so you'd, you'd, you'd be on the lookout for more of that. Um, but as far as the effect that you would get from a visual perspective, some people prefer that um, rather than to the practicality of exterior storm windows. And they all come in all different kinds, um, which again is also really nice depending on, you know, the environment that you want to set in the house. You're welcome, James. Maureen, I think there was also a question in the chat. Um, can you describe the thought process when someone is installing solar panels? What's the thought process as to what would be reviewed and approved by SHPO or that follows the, the standards? Sure, so, um, so when it comes to solar panels, um, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of questions when it comes to that. Um, and a lot of people, when they're talking about what's approved or what's not approved, often what they're talking about is a local level of approval, um, which is not, you know, from the perspective of, of our office, the general practice is to be that solar panels should be installed on a non-public facing slope. Um, nation, and because theoretically they are reversible and again, you know, solar units themselves have a finite lifespan and they need to be replaced depending on how long you are at your home. As long as it's not really in the public facing right of way, the interventions onto um, the historic fabric into the roof are minimal. You know, there are some solar panels that require reinforcement of roof framing, depending on the condition of the roof. Um, that's the general guiding principle. And then also I mentioned there are ground mounted solar arrays, which are becoming increasingly popular for people who, who have some more um, acreage or maybe where their house is sited, they actually don't have a great view. Um, actually because you know maybe they have some passive influence of trees uh, they don't have a great view for solar that is directly on the roof but in a portion of their yard they get a lot of sun um, and so the the question with that one is to just make sure that you um, consider the implications for any ar potential archaeological resources when you install a ground mounted solar array that's a general principle great thanks marina I know we had considered um, ground mounted arrays too at Preservation Connecticut, but since we're located sort of in a public park setting and we don't technically own the land that the building sets on, <laughs> that, that wasn't really a good solution for us, but it would have been a bigger um, intrusion in the landscape than having it on our building in a, on a, a the, the south facing um, roof 
of our building happens to be facing inward towards the park and not to the public street. So it, it worked better for us. Yeah, and it's a low profile. I mean, if you saw in the presentation, I put a little check, check mark. That was a that was a good one. Um, you know, again, two extreme examples. Um, but ground mounted solar arrays, depending on you know your landscaping and your siting, it may be proven beneficial. Um, you know, that using utilizing the existing landscape um, it is becoming something that people are considering more and more as part of um, being passively um, energy efficient and increasing that sustainability. So there are things like you know lower gardens that. Um, you know, are you, they're using as rain collection gardens, um, to help or to, you know, to help, to help, um, irrigation measures or in other places, you know, putting solar panels or of course, you know, utilizing geothermal if you can, or if you can share something like that geothermal, you know, a lot of times, like I mentioned, it's, it, it's kind of hard for an individual homeowner, but um, sometimes adjacent homes can share the same system and that might work if you're in a neighborhood or something like that. Uh, do you include trees in your environmental reviews because of their passive contributions to climate control of historic buildings? Um, depends on if these trees are a character defining feature of the resource. So if something's very important, let's say we're dealing with um, an estate. Um, Jenny Schofield isn't here. Uh, she's our national register coordinator, but she did a, um, we did a recent nomination for a wonderful formerly private estate um, in New Canaan. Um, and it had a very impressive landscape um, designed by the Olmstead Brothers firm. Uh, and in that case, we may consider trees. We may consider landscape planting and design like that if they are character defining features. So I think that's what it would come down to, whether it's character defining. Um, if it's a city tree and it is providing passive recreation that's on the homeowner to you know, advocate for retention of it, if it helps in their energy saving costs, but it wouldn't be something we would consider from a perspective of historic preservation. But thanks for your question. I have a couple of minutes left if anyone else has a question for Marina. And if you have any questions, please um, feel free to email me. Um, I'm always happy to answer. Oh, I will say for the person who, when they registered, is it more or less efficient to run an old wood burning fireplace in the winter to reduce energy loads? I do not know, but the Environmental Protection Agency has an article called Energy Efficiency and Your Wood-Burning Appliance. So I would recommend that you check it out because they have a lot of resources and you may be able to get some detail on that. Uh, thank you for the Q&A. This is Chris um, and Alan sharing a computer. Um, since we joined late, could you share your email, please? Sure, um, it's my name. So it's um, marina.wisniewski at ct.gov and you can also find it on our staff page at um, ct, what is it? Uh, .gov. No, ct.gov backslash oh, CT. historic preservation. <laughs> That's the yeah. easiest way to get there without navigating through the other website. All right, thank you. And You're will, welcome. will you all be providing a recording of this or the slideshow? Yes, we'll follow up with an email to everyone with the slide deck. Um, the link to the, the Zoom recording will be on our YouTube channel, which is on the Preservation Connecticut's um, homepage. So that'll be available in a day or two. But we'll, we'll follow up with an email, Chris, to everyone with the resources that Marina um, referenced and with the slide deck. Perfect, thank you. And Chris, if you have any specific questions, you can always contact us. This is Stacy. Um, you can just write me and I'll get you the answer you need. All right, looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Marina. This was fantastic. Yeah, thanks guys. I appreciate the opportunity. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks, Bye -bye. Marina. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>